Good morning, everyone. Uh, I see about 350 cell phones and even a few people. Uh, my name is Dirk Wondel. I run open source for Verizon, and you are? And uh, I'm Linus, and the reason we have this set up where Dirk asks questions is that I absolutely love doing public speaking. And I've been doing it for a long time, and I have never started liking it, but I actually like an AI question where I don't know the question. So questions will be as surprising to me as they are to you. <laughs> I'll be surprised too. So, um, this is your first trip to Hong Kong, right? Yes, for some reason I've never come to Hong Kong before. I mean, we there have been various conferences and events here, but for all of the events I've gone to Asia, never Hong Kong before this. So I think this is my fourth or maybe fifth time in Hong Kong. I love being here. I absolutely love the food. Um, so we had great dinner yesterday. For some reason, in it, <laughs> it sounds very much like the opening joke on the Super Trump Paris album. <laughs> for those old enough to remember the Super Trump Paris album. Um, I have an important question for everyone here in the room. Who is younger than 33 years old? Give us a hand. Congratulations, because by listening to this, Linux today, almost today, is 33 years old. 33 years ago, you yep. said that for the first time. Yes, on, on, on this Sunday, it will be 33 years ago since I sent the first email. It wasn't the release of Linux, but it was the first email where I publicly said, hey, I've been working on this thing since April. Uh, it's almost ready now. And here we are, literally, a, a third of a century after, because it's 33 years plus four months, so a third of a year. And it's still almost ready now. So, um, we'll see if we ever get there, but I doubt it. Yeah, so I, I don't think so. so uh, Late release. 11 RC4. I always need to write this down so I don't get it wrong. Which then turns into the funny thing when I look back later of which release versions we did these talks. And what's interesting? What's fun? We're actually, what's interesting to me is how we've been doing this same release process now for almost 20 years. And uh, you don't that all the basics would have been fixed long ago. And it turns that's not actually the truth. A lot of the discussions we have going on right now, both privately and on the mailing list, are still about some very core kernel operations. We have a long discussions about memory management, which, which is not like some new hardware thing. I mean, new hardware is, is where a lot of the lines of development goes, and that's why uh, drivers tends to be half of every single new kernel release. But I just find it interesting that we're still discussing really core issues that I would have thought were solved ages ago, but apparently new, new behavior patterns end up meaning that we still need to tweak these very core things. And, and I like that. I, I'm not complaining at all. This is this is why I do operating systems, is because of those kinds of core issues. And I find it interesting. Funny you bring that up because one of the things that you had said would land in system, the extensible scheduler, then didn't. Right. So, so that was actually that was very unfortunate. Uh, we had uh, I had already planned that that this release would be one where you could actually do your own scheduler in. Well, partly in user land and partly by using BPF, which is our just in time compiler in the kernel. And uh, it turns out we had uh, a guest in the developer community that messed up some of the scheduler scheduling. And that this new feature that a lot of people were excited about got delayed by another release. Do you think it would be in 6.12? Well, I. I will knock wood because I was sure it's going to be 6.11, but yes, it looks like we are now looking at 6.12.
But this is an entity that are into the future. The current current yeah. right. um, John, I, I really have this policy of um, the details that really matter. I mean, we have we have kind of big picture ideas of where we want to go in the long range, but most of the real development is getting all the details right. And you don't you don't look five years ahead for that. You look one or two releases ahead, and then you actually may know that somebody's working on something that will maybe take longer than that. And some features do take longer than that. We will have later this year, we will have the 20th anniversary of the Time Linux project. So this is a project that literally started 20 years ago. And the people involved finally at the point where they feel like it was done and it has already, they're still on, <laughs> on they're still tweaking the last things, but so that it will be completely merged in the upstream kernel. So when people think that we do kernel development very quickly and we do releases every two months, it's true, but it's true partly because there's all this parallel development going on and some features actually happen fairly quickly and can happen in a couple of months. But a lot of features have years and in these seldom decades of work behind them before they actually get fully merged and are are done and become part of the standard. But I think this is such an, an interesting position. On the one hand, we have this plan more than a release ahead. We're waiting for things to get done. On the other hand, the process itself is incredibly technical and in this case. But on some math, on average, 11 kernels every two years, so it's five and six and five and six. And we typically rest the major number around 19 or 20 because you get bored. Right? Because it's too many, uh, too high a number. When I can't count on my finger and toes, I need to start something new. It may have been too much to get. Um, so with that in mind, 6.20 will be released around May 2026. In July 2026, um, likely but oh in late 28, which gets us to kernel 8.7 for your 16th birthday. Um, okay, that's too much math by now. <laughs> Can you talk about the features in kernel 8.7? No, I really don't know that far ahead. I, I do like, would like to go back to your point that we've had a very structured in the development process. And that came from us historically not having a very structured development process and things being a bit chaotic. And that was very good in the beginning, but when a lot of companies go along and become part of the development community, and on the other hand, you also have distributions that need to be able to plan for the future. The chaotic development process really ended up being very painful for me in particular, but for other people too. And that's why we now have three big tools of not the low level code itself. Those good code is good code, but we I keep very strict tools in in release management. So if the code is not ready by the time the merge window opens, I will not take it because I don't want the kind of pain that we had plus years ago. We we have a very reliable release process, even if the individual features may then not always be used in a very yeah a timely manner. In a week of each other, you can you know in RC seven, RC eight, but it's so reliable, so close, so fascinating. And the fact that it has worked this reliably, this consistently for nearly twenty years. I mean. It's actually interesting because um, we used to have a release code on, I mean, clearly some of you are young enough that you don't remember our chaotic days. But we used to have a release schedule where we would release, or I would release every, the goal was every year, but it actually took more like two years to get everything done. And it became very really painful just because it really was so big and so much changed. And, and about 20 years ago, 
calling people in one container summits, I'm going to change things up. And instead of aiming for once a year, I will want to aim for every six weeks. And people literally, I mean, it was like, this is impossible. You can't go from one year that drags out to two years to six weeks. And, and I said, no, but I really, really, really want to play it. And the six weeks didn't work out. The fact that we are, are every roughly nine weeks is pretty reliable. And, uh, and people are generally happy, as happy as kernel developers ever are. Uh, 20 years in, we're not going to change this process. It's actually been very interesting. And I think a lot of other open source projects end up looking at the kernel development and trying to see how that works for them because an old model has worked so well for so long. I actually know very few projects who aim for nine or ten weeks. That is one of the most aggressive schedules I have said. We still change things, however. So the processes are not all consistent. So for example, six months ago, the Linux kernel community took ownership of the CD process by directly mostly. And I thought it was super interesting because security has become such a big topic everywhere. And now it is your great talk to this for you to the figure out about average the Linux kernel every week. So is it time? Um there's always time to panic when it comes to security. And that's the problem of sometimes with security is that uh, we do have a lot of development going on and we do fix a lot of bugs. But because we are actively developing it, bugs are inevitable. There is no question about that. And uh, you can have a lot of processes in place to make them fewer. You can have this is put in place to make them less fatal when you do hit a bug, and we have that. We can have a lot of tools to make sure that certain classes of bugs are found very quickly. But bugs will happen, and any bug can pretty much be a security bug if somebody is clever enough to figure out how to misuse that bug. So being a kernel, security is obviously one of the most critical things we have to keep in mind, but at the same time, we need to move forward, we need to support new hardware, we need to support all these new ways of doing development or using hardware, and we, that means that we can't make security the only priority. Um, and I think one of the reasons Greg wanted to take over the CVEs was getting somebody else maintain a list of kernel bugs was pretty painful. Yeah. It was too easy to make CD. It made no sense at all. So now Greg is in the enviable position of having to deal with this all, and I'm so happy I don't. <laughs> so, two years ago, I asked you a similar question, and you answered with a very interesting statement. And it's like, every security issue fundamentally is just about and, and I think this is super important when you do your 60 CDs a week. That just means we find another 60 bugs and we work on them. And the thing that Linux is good at is how quickly we address them and how quickly we figure out ways to, to get that out to people. So one of the reasons I stress the whole that security issues are just bugs is that there's this tendency in the the industry to treat security issues as something really, really, really special. It actually ends up harming everybody. It means that people have these 90 day delays before anything gets done. And sometimes the 90 day embargoes end up being more like 400 day embargoes. We've had those too. And, uh, and it's very demoralizing to the developer as well. They sometimes have a known bug that they need to sit on because they have agreed with some external party that, okay, we will not talk about this bug because it's a security issue and you want to make a press release about it, but you want to make a press release at a very particular time. 
and that ends up being very painful for development processes. So we have pushed back against it. Essentially, uh, the security is, for example, it's a rule that we do not do embargoes that are longer than one week. Uh, the initial IT security policies just end up hurting development a lot. But typically, the really long embargoes are part of it. So, happily or happily, unhappily, hardware bugs also happen, right? And then the hardware people really freak out. And they say, we can't fix this in seven days like you guys can. Uh, so, then they have these enormously long embargoes. And it, I'm happy to say it's much less stressful now than it was a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, we had multiple ending hardware bugs. Everybody was, everybody in the core kernel community knew about that couldn't do anything about it because we were not allowed to even mention what was going on. So, in, in this context, when we talk about security bugs, uh, whatever the question may be, the answer is always the wrong. So. One of the things that we have been talking about for more than two years now is the increased footprint of Rust in the in the kernel. The very slowly increased footprint of Rust. It has been a bit frustrating. I think I was expecting it to be faster, but part of it, a large part of it, admittedly, has been a lot of old-time kernel developers are so used to C and really don't know Rust. They're not exactly excited about having to learn a whole new language that is, in some respects, really different. So there's been, there's been some pushback on Rust for that reason. Another reason has been the Rust infrastructure itself has not been super stable. So we actually only, I think in 6.10, so the last release I made, we finally got to the point where uh, the Rust compiler that we can use for the current part of uh, the Rust part is actually the standard Rust compiler, and you don't, we don't need to have extra, like version checks and things like that. So I'm hoping we're over some of the initial problems, but it has taken us more than two years, and, and we're not there yet. It will happen. Things take time. In, in the whole context of security, I know you'll get bored with my question, but I have one more for you. Um, one of the interesting things that I've found is that, that push and pull between LTS and LTS, right? an old kernel, meaning for a very long time, and things get backported and backported and backported, versus that we have seen with a number of vendors, Google and Android being one, Ubuntu is starting to do this, Debian starting to do this. Instead, even though you keep a released version of an OS stable, to update to a newer kernel. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on should people stay on an old kernel and rely on backport? Or does it more sense to do the user space guarantees and all that to simply go to a newer kernel? Well, again, this is a question that doesn't have an answer. It will depend on your situation. And it's probably something that Greg, a few days ago, would have been better answering because he he's one of the main LTS maintainers. We, it goes both ways. Uh, there is some stability in working with an old kernel, but at the same time, it is unquestionably true that the old kernels we do backport patches and fixes to them, but some, some fixes get missed because people don't think they're important enough. And then it turns out they were important after all. We more commonly want to be on a more modern kernel way to support more modern hardware, which is obviously one of the bigger parts of the kernel. But quite often what happens is Companies that stayed back and said, we want stability and we want to stick with this stable kernel, they stay back for a year or two, and they're happy. And they don't have security issues. But then after a couple of years, they realize we need to move forward because you now we've, we're on this really old system that does not support modern hardware. 
And then they figure out this is really painful because now they've stayed back for two years, three years, maybe longer, and trying to do this thing to a lot more modern problem ends up being very hard. And maybe things that they knew because they stayed back and used an old kernel, we broke them in the meantime. So the rest of the world has moved on and doesn't do what this old kernel does anymore. And because they stayed back, they never noticed. And now they have a huge pain of, of upgrading everything around it. So I think that's one of the reasons why we almost all reasons we start off with the staying back model. Then after enough of those pain points, they decide, no, let's do more of a rolling release where we keep more up to date so that we figure out our problems more often and never have these two things that are so painful. We keep you up to these Chinese embedded vendors who are still on the 4.9 kernel. Yeah, that's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for saying Some people stay back so long that even the super long kernel, like the Nintendo's kernels, maybe you've completely forgotten about them. If you get bug reports about some of these old kernels that some people still use, you would say, sorry, we can't help. Uh, that's so long ago that we don't even remember what that is anymore. And the embedded people, to some degree, still are the main point in this respect. So, let's change topics. Higher up the stack. This is not just an open source summit, this is a quick one. So, a lot of conversations about code. You didn't know that, and I didn't know that. It's native. The only thing that matters is the kernel, right? Okay, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I promise you that sounds like. One of the things that is so interesting, if you look at cloud computing, if you look at Kubernetes, of course, as the dominant platform in that space, scaling becomes a very different problem. Because scaling now goes not like the kernel does over more and more cores, but scaling goes over more and more systems and more and more of the infrastructure. And for a very long time, at least in our career, we were used to the Moore's law bundling of every 18 months, and I mean, that's So, when you look at these larger scale issues as something that will be limiting what we do as a community? Well, the honest answer has to be no. And, and, but I'll give you the background to that. One of the, one of the things that makes me enjoy open source so much personally, I mean, one of them is obviously just the community and being involved and having lots of different people that you communicate with, that's what really keeps me going. But the thing that makes it all practical is that people specialize in what they're interested in. And when I say no, it's because it's not my interest for you. So, so when it comes to things like cloud and uh, Kubernetes or AI to fix the topic of the day. I, I see myself as a kernel person who wants to support that, but at the same time, I don't see myself as the person who is interested in the end result. So when AI people came in, it was wonderful because suddenly NVIDIA got much more involved in on the kernel side. And, and, and NVIDIA went from being on my list of companies who are not good to my list of companies who are doing really good work. So AI was great in that respect, but that doesn't mean that I personally end up being interested in the AI side. I end up being interested in what we needed to do in the kernel to support the AI side. There was a lot of memory management in particular that ended up being uh, one for all these AI loads want to use accelerators in user space and so on. Uh, but at the same time, I, I still see myself as a core kernel person and I think it's actually a good thing that people specialize and you get kind of these blinders. 
So when people ask me about Linux use in the cloud, I'm like, I, I know Linux, but don't know cloud. So thank you for opening the door to the topic. Oh, oh no, it's going to be AI, isn't it? Artificial intelligence it is nothing but predicting the next word in a sentence. But as we talked about a couple of times already, there are really interesting use cases for LLMs. And one of the ones that you talked about the last time we had this conversation was code review and making the work of maintainers easier. I'm curious if you see progress there. I'm well, there may be progress happening in slide the companies are doing this work. I have been talking to people who are looking at this, looking at making AI understand no code. Um, and uh, I am hopeful. I mean, I don't like AI in the sense that it's uh, a horrible hype that everybody talks about, including us here on stage. And, and it, and it keeps on coming, and at some point you just want to tune it out. So at the same time, I'm hoping that in, in, in five years, maybe even sooner, we'll be in the situation where we take AI more for granted, and we actually have these everyday tools that aren't just writing. And I realize very well that you can use AI today to write JavaScript and Python and things like that. But I, we're not at the point where AI is yet helping us find bad patterns in the kernel, of course, for example. But there are people working on that, and I'm actually very optimistic about it. I think we have a lot of tools to help us. I'm not so much interested in the writing code. I'm much more interested in the finding bugs proactively and doing code review and helping containers and developers write better code. Um, I think we will get there, but we're not quite there yet. Since the title of this conference is the idea that we have people here, again, work on LLMs. What does Linus Torvalds mean for an AI tool to do, for an LLM to do, in order to be useful for you as a maintainer? So what I've been hoping for, and I w I've been talking to a couple of people that I just knew from before that are working at big companies that I won't name, but who are working on AI. What I'm kind of hoping for is uh, not the traditional LM that uh, just predicts what you're doing, but something that hopefully takes the kernel source code history and other projects also into account and uh, learns what pattern, patterns are. And uh, red flags, things that it says, this looks suspicious because we have a lot of these tools that already red flag things that are fairly obvious bugs. Right now, most of the tools are at the fairly obvious stage. Uh, and I think AI can do better. Um, but uh, I also think this is probably something that a lot of people are interested in, but it's probably not commercially the number one priority for AI companies. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I do think that pulling them is able to look at practice and highlight whether they fit into the way kernel code is written or they don't. That would be not just for us in the Linux community useful, but would be more broad. As you pointed out at the beginning, you actually don't know what I'm asking you. So I collect the questions, I figure out what I'm going to do. And of course, this is the age of ChatGPT and many uh -huh. other of these tools. I went online and asked what are the 10 questions I should ask Linux to call in an interview. I will read this from my note card. How do you see the future of open source software evolving, especially with the rise of the services of proprietary platforms? Okay. Well, this is actually why I like doing these Q&A sessions with Richard, because he doesn't do the bullshit, like, uh, uh, questions about, yes, what's the big vision and, 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 and things like that. I've never had a big vision. I don't want to have them. I, 
Yeah, so to speak, the victims were driving some mind issues. <laughs> I, I really I see myself as a plodding engineer, and I'm proud of that. So I, I, don't, I don't like the what's your vision for the future of open source. I will say that after going through the different questions that were proposed by ChatGPT, I was quite certain that I will continue to have a job interviewing you for a little longer. I think that is the perfect moment to start this session at 6 o'clock right now, to zero, so we are on time. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I look forward to the next event in Hong Kong.